I've always wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail. Someday, maybe a portion of it, I will. The Appalachian Trail runs from northern Georgia to north central Maine, about 2,200 miles. And the halfway point is Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. That's where the headquarters are of the trail as well. And that's where uh, uh, Jane Lee and Geraldine Largue started their journey heading northbound from the halfway point to the finish line north on April 23, 2013. They made good progress. They hiked their way into New Hampshire by June, making good time. And that's when Mrs. Lee had to leave the trail due to a family emergency. But Geraldine Largue decided to go on alone. She wasn't totally alone because her husband was meeting her every time the trail crossed the road. He was there with supplies. Maybe they were going to camp in their trunk or some their truck or something, but then she would go on walking. He would catch her at the next crossroads. And that's how they were going to finish the hike. By July 21, Geraldine was in western Maine. She is about 200 miles from Mount Katahd in the end of the trail. And she planned to meet her husband at Route 27 there in Maine, which was about 20 miles a day, about two days hike up and down through the mountains of Maine. A fellow hiker took a picture of Geraldine at 6.30 a.m. on July 22 as she was about to set off northbound on the trail while her fellow companion was heading southbound on the same trail. This was the last time anybody saw her alive. She got lost in the dense wood. Uh, she got off the trail to go to the bathroom and she couldn't find her way back. That's how thick the forest is. Right away she texted her husband for help. Mr. Largay never received that text or any of the others that followed because of poor cell phone coverage in that remote area. When he, uh, she didn't show up as planned at Route 27, he quickly notified the authorities and a search was made. All the guys and girls were, of rescue teams were called out, but she was not found. So meanwhile, she set up camp. She waited for help, thinking that help would soon find her. She wrote details in her diary from July 22 to August 10, waiting for searchers to come or parceling out her food, make sure she could get by. No one came. Fast forward two years a logging company surveyor stumbled across her campsite by chance and found her remains. Uh, she was zipped up in her sleeping bag inside her tent with some of her prized possessions and her diary close by. It turned out that she was just two miles from the main trail. In our day of cell phones and GPS, getting lost has become rare. I know you can still do it. You can still do it. That darn GPS, why did it take me clear around that way? You can still get lost, but it's harder to do these days. But there are other ways to get lost too. Sometimes you feel hopeless. Um, sometimes when facing a, a disease like cancer or an addiction, or a divorce or loss of a loved one, you can feel alone and depressed from a lot of reasons, for a lot of reasons, right? Uh, the Bible uses the term lost to describe people who have not been adopted into the Father's family. It's a hard term. The Father's hosting a great banquet, but lost people have either never received the invitation to the banquet or they've rejected the invitation to the banquet. Jesus saw people surrounding him. He described them himself as sheep without a shepherd, hopeless and helpless. 
One time he had dinner with uh, Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He was criticized for keeping company with a guy like that. And he said at the end of that conversation, he came to seek and save that which is lost. He used the term lost. In Luke 15, it's called the lost chapter. Jesus tells stories about a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son. He said some very disturbing things about people who are lost and facing judgment. I'm going to buzz through these pretty quickly, but in Matthew 8, 11 and 12, he says, I say, many will come from east and west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, Renee, I'm going to buzz through the next two, but you get the same term, weeping and gnashing of teeth, in Matthew 24, uh, 48 through 51, when Jesus talks about a servant who's not on the ball. He says, my servants, my master's staying away a long time. Therefore, I'm just going to do what I want. And at the end, Jesus pronounces judgment on that guy and says he will be cut to pieces and assigned with him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They come down to Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, and uh, uh, Jesus says, throw those worthless servants out, outside. I'm sorry, I'm before the sheep and the goats. Though, you count me for that. Throw that servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Three times, it's Jesus who tells us that punishment. Then at the end of Matthew 25, he talks about those who didn't take care of others. When did you see me hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and didn't help me? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then these harsh words, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. These are hard sayings. And I don't like it when Jesus talks like that. I like the loving, compassionate Jesus. Eternal punishment, weeping, gnashing of teeth. Half the world has never heard the invitation to the great banquet the Father is hosting. Half the world lives in a culture or language that has no church reaching out to them. Uh, there's a term that we've used for many years here that we learn from others. It's called unreached people groups. Those are groups of people around the world that don't have enough followers of Jesus inside their group to evangelize their own people. Like Americans can reach out to Americans, but in some places that's not true because people don't know. It means there's about 7,300 unreached groups of people representing about 3.4 billion people. Now, these statistics and these words of Jesus raise a big question. What about the lost? What happens to them? Are we to just go along merrily on our way? It's on them, tough luck. Well, down through history, some have taught that since God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, he in his great compassion will find a way at the very end of time to save everyone. This is one of the teachings of the Universalist Church uh, that has spread to many denominations. We're all going to end up in the same place. So it really doesn't matter what religion you follow or really what you believe. God in his grace and compassion will cover you. My friends, I hope that is right. But it runs against the teachings of Jesus. He clearly taught of an eternal hell. In Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31, you remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus that were separated 
by this deep, unchangeable gulf between the saved and the lost. Jesus' story, not ours, right? That's the story of Jesus. In his most famous sermon, he clearly taught that the majority of people in the world are on the wide road that leads to destruction. I don't like it. What are we supposed to do with these very clear statements from Jesus himself? Think about it for a minute with me. If sin will be overlooked by God, then the death of Christ was uh, meaningless. He didn't need to come and die if there's another way out of this mess. He alone is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. But if everyone is saved, then his terrible death was not necessary. Right? Peter was the one who said salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. It is an uncomfortable truth and an uncomfortable position that Christians find themselves. The teaching about the atonement, the truth that Jesus teaches that he's the only option for heaven has caused many churches just to say that's not what the Bible means. They reject the authority of Scripture. And very learned scholars have taken the position that God is all-powerful and He will save everyone at the end of time. I don't know if that's true, then why did Jesus command His followers to go into all the world and preach the gospel? Why did He make this the top priority of His church? Simply, people believe that since God is just and fair, He, he will not condemn a person who is sincere and at least seeking truth. I don't know what you do with that. That's a hard one. Uh, Henry Cobb was the architect and Bruno Thurlman was the engineer. Uh, these were experienced, professional, sincere men who designed and built the 60-story John Hancock building in Boston in the early 70s. It's a beautiful glass building that reflects the sun. It was a trendsetter at that time. But even during construction of that skyscraper, several 500 pound sheets of glass fell away from the building to the street below. Um, the opening of the building was delayed uh, for almost four years. The cost of the building originally was $75 million. It turned out to be $175 million. It was discovered that there was a flaw in the window design. And so eventually, all 10,334 panes of glass had to be taken off and replaced at the cost of the glass manufacturer. At one point, that 60-story building became known as the Plywood Palace in Boston because it was just covered with plywood. Not very appealing to the eye. But the architect and the contractor and the window manufacturer were very sincere about their work. Sincerity ignores reality sometimes. I would ask you this very hard question. What does the Bible teach about the eternal condition of those who never accepted the gospel, never heard the gospel? What do you do with that? The famous verse that we all know is John 3, 16 and 17 and 18. And then verse 36 of John 3. Let me read that for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now skipping down the chapter to verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. 
But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Uh, these are very uncomfortable scriptures. Um, we are committed to the authority of Scripture, whether we like what it says or not. That's where we are. The Scripture clearly teaches that some go to eternal life and some perish. God's intent, according to chapter 3 of John, verse 17, is that the world would be saved through Jesus. So what do we do with the universalist thinking that all roads lead to heaven? This is the uncomfortable truth for a church uh, doing missions month this October. The uncomfortable truth, oh yeah. Uh, what about the lost and what about my responsibility to the lost? Jesus said in unmistakable terms, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then again, Peter adds in Acts 4, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else. It's clear there's two kinds of people, the saved and the lost. It's clear that the way of salvation is through Christ. No one comes to the Father except through me. But the question for us is what to do? How can a loving and just God be like this? How do you explain that to your friends and acquaintances when we get into these discussions and they say, you really don't think a loving and compassionate God would actually send people to hell who, who rejected him one time or who've never heard of him? It's tough, isn't it? How do you handle it? God did not create robots that are programmed to love him. He created mankind with this freedom to choose. All of us at first chose the option of rejecting him and going our own way. As Mitch said, all of us have this in common. This is our identity. We were lost. But God in his great love provided a way back through the, though, or I'm sorry, though the cost was uh, revolting. Still, this is God who loves and doesn't force his way on us, but waits patiently for us to come to our senses. And those, unfortunately, those who choose to reject him are free to make that choice with our uh, sorrow and compassion. This... This subject requires great wisdom and great uh, grace because we've all been there. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. No one is innocent. All stand condemned. I would say that we don't have the same level of condemnation. This is one example of, of Jesus kind of maybe giving greater punishment and a little bit lesser punishment. Here's one. Jesus said, in Luke 10, it would be more bearable for pagan cities like Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than Bethsaida and Capernaum. Why? Well, because in the last two cities mentioned there, Jesus performed many miracles and taught there. He showed up there, and people did not repent and turn to him. The first two towns mentioned in that text had less information they also did evil and didn't turn to God. It seems like Jesus is saying it will be more bearable for the pagan cities who rejected him than the cities of the Hebrews that had some form of faith and rejected him. It's delicate. I, I know that some say it's based on how much light you have received and what did you do with that light when you received it? What did you do? I have a friend here in town that's a minister. 
He did not grow up in a Christian family. Uh, he never went to church as a kid, but he heard a little bit about the Bible from some friends and some other people. As a little guy, being impressed with his classmates, he decided he was going to save up his money, and he went to the, sorry, this is an old school term, five and dime store, and decided that uh, he would use his money at age 10 not to buy candy or baseball cards or comic books, but to buy a Bible. One of those little Bibles, New Testament and Psalms. Those little Bibles that we used to have. He read a chapter a day. At Ten years old, nobody to teach him. He didn't understand much. He got into some of the stories of Jesus that were helpful in understanding, but really he was on his own. Little by little, he was given more light and desire grew in him to know more about it. And even now, not far from where we sit, he's still teaching and speaking for Christ. God does give more light to people who respond to the first glimpses of light. But the Bible still doesn't back down. I wish it would. I wish it would. I wish it would just say, oh, it's all going to be all right. Don't worry about it. This from Romans 1, 18. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His in eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that, so that men are without excuse. And then he says in chapter 2 of Romans, when, men, uh, when we do by nature the things that are written in the law, it shows the requirements of the law are written on our hearts. Somehow we're born with this instinct to know good and evil, right? Well, God's solution for lost people is to send human messengers. That's what he wants done. Paul said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? And how can they believe in one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Suppose no one goes to these 7,300 unreached people groups. Suppose no one tells these 3.4 billion of their lostness and of the way out. On this, the Bible is silent. What about those who've never heard? What about those who've never been baptized? For me, the answer is simple because I am simple. Uh, there is one judge and it isn't me. He is gracious and compassionate. If he chooses to do something outside of what he says in the Word of God, that's certainly his choice. He is sovereign. He has got all authority. He can do what he wants. But from what we can read in Scripture... Christ is the only alternative. We have this beautiful statement from Revelation, it's chapter 16. Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. He's going to do the right thing. We're not called to be judges, but we are called to and commissioned as God's ambassadors to invite lost people to the great banquet. You were part of Amnesty International. Maybe you didn't know that, but you're part of it. You get to declare uh, God's amnesty program to people in captivity. You explain how you yourself were set free and how they can be too. Again, God can save anyone he wants. He doesn't owe us an answer, right? But if there's a way to God outside of Jesus, 
He has not told us so in Scripture. Here's what I know. The condition of the lost breaks the heart of God, but it doesn't seem to register with God's own people. It doesn't seem to activate them. It pretty much causes us to say, well, it stinks to be them. Sorry about that. And we move on. I can invite the girls up to help us close and worship here in, in song in just a minute. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is what we know for sure. We know for sure that the road is narrow. Nine out of every ten people are lost. One of every two have no messenger. And the church, the sleeping giant, rolls over, adjusts its pillow, and goes back to sleep. Why are we like that? Do we think there is another way? Do we think that someone else will take on this responsibility? Or is it just because we don't care? It's a hard subject. Probably one you didn't want to hear when the Buffalo Bills are playing football on Sunday morning. But it's disturbing. Last night, Deb and I went to see our granddaughter perform in a musical. I didn't know anyone there. A small theater, Amherst. Every room or every seat taken, though. I don't know, 125 people there maybe? I don't know. Uh, we stayed for a little bit. I stayed too late. <laughs> We talked a little bit, and I couldn't help but think, all these people, all these great people listening to live music now and having fun and probably going to get up this morning and watch the Bills game and probably not very many of them going to spend time breaking bread together with the saints. And what about them? Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for the clear teaching of Scripture, uh, even though it's not fun to read. Help us to share your amnesty program. Fill us with passion and compassion for people. Help us to be faithful with the opportunities you put in front of us today and this week to have conversations and share invitations with people who've never received an invitation and just don't know. Uh, Lord, there's a job globally and there's a job locally. Would you use our church to raise up and send workers out into the harvest field? Help us to send them globally and locally. Help us to be quick with invitations and a welcome and a sincerity that wants people to know what we know about the bread of life. Uh, move us as a church, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.